National Open Access Week. Welcome to the Print Archival Practices and New Media Panel. First, on behalf of this event, I would like to share this Indigenous Peoples Land and Territory Acknowledgement. Founded in 1889, the University of New Mexico sits on the traditional homelands of the Pueblo of Sandia, the original peoples of New Mexico, Pueblo, Navajo, and Apache, since time immemorial, have deep connections to the land and have made significant contributions to the broader communities statewide. Myself and those who remain stewards of this land throughout the generations and also acknowledge our committed relationship to indigenous peoples. We gratefully recognize our history. And now I would like to introduce myself. My name is Maria Erin Jones. I am the OER Fellow. I'm gonna, um, let's see, is everybody in? Somebody else pop up, sorry. Um, I am the OER Fellow and I am an M MFA candidate in dramatic writing here at UNM. As it is related to the panel today, I would also like to share that I'm the founder and co-producer of ABQ Zine Fest, New Mexico's first and the oldest zine festival, now in its 13th year. And now I would like to introduce the panelists. Carol A. Wells is an activist, art historian, curator, lecturer, and writer. She has been collecting protest posters and producing poster exhibitions since 1981. Trained as a medievalist at UCLA, she taught the history of art and architecture for 13 years at CSU Fullerton. Her articles are on political posters, have appeared in numerous publications, and she has lectured extensively throughout the US and abroad. Amy Sulser, also on our panel, began her time at the Center for Study of Political Graphics as a volunteer in 2015. She is now the archives director and oversees three other archivists in the cataloging, preservation, digitization, and management of CSPG's collections. Sulcer received her MLIS from UCLA and her BA in art history and visual art from Occidental College. She worked on a variety of archival projects at art institutions in Los Angeles, including the Skirball Cultural Center, Los Angeles Contemporary Exhibitions, and the Getty Research Institute. Kenneth Orvets received his PhD in literature from Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts in 2023. His research focuses on investigating contemporary media culture materiality and reading practices through the study of art comics. His pedagogy focuses on inclusive strategies for entwining in instruction and reading comprehension, comprehension <laughs> collegiate success and multimodal rhetoric. Dr. Suzanne, I'm sorry, Dr. Kim Horvitz. Dr. Suzanne Anderson Riedel, is Associate Professor of European Art and Chair of the Department of Art at the University of New Mexico. She received her MA in Art History from Freiburg, Germany, and her PhD from UCLA with a focus on European art in the 18th and 19th centuries. Okay, I've introduced all of you, and so let's begin with, um, with your presentations. Who would like to go first? Carol, will you start us off, please? And we can queue up your slides here. So, I, I actually, let me start with a question. Um, I was given some questions. Is that how I should start my presentation? Or I should actually just talk a little bit about the slides and then go into that first question of how I started. I think if you would like to um, start with your slides, that would be great. And then we can go into questions. <clears throat> Well, thank you all for 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 doing this and for for having Emily and and myself to to um to speak about the work that we do and hopefully spread spread the word to a to a, a broader audience. The the I, I I was told that you wanted to focus on community and so I picked five slides that deal with different aspects um, of community organizing and building community. Through the posters, the 
You, I don't know if you want to, I think you're going to be showing them, right? Because I don't, that's what I was told. That's why we sent them that's to where, you. We're showing the slides here. Oh, I just can't see them. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. that's unfortunate. Oh, um, no. Is there any way you can have it so I can see them also? Uh, I, uh, you should be able to see the slides. I mean, I think I think I'm, I'm only seeing I'm seeing my names. I'm seeing the slide that has the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, my name and Emily's name. Ah, oh, that's the first one. Perfect. Okay, perfect. So then, if you would just like to call out when you want the slides changed, and we will change them. Okay. So um, and I just want to make sure I don't run too long. So this first slide um is trying. I mean, most of the slides are dealing with. Um, or anti-gentrification. That's really a fairly consistent theme throughout the 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 building community um, posters that we have. And we have many from actually around the world. I think all of the ones I've picked here are from the United States. Um, this is actually a 10 year struggle that was partially a victory, partially not. Uh, that started in 1979 when um, they were trying to uh, tear down a neighborhood that had uh, was a lot of affordable housing. And one of the last buildings that was surviving was um, called the International Hotel, which was where 196 low-income, mainly elderly Filipino and Chinese men uh, had been living. There is one actual resident, the man you see in the front with his fist in the air and the fist breaking forward. Uh, Felix Eisen, Filipino, he had been living there since um, 19, till, since, since the late 20s. So it was really yeah, 1928. And he they fought it for 10 years. It was the students from Berkeley and, and Cal, uh, uh, San Francisco State literally fought them off. There were like six, at least six major confrontations over 10 years with the police, the confrontations, the delay. Uh, gave them another 10 years, but they finally lost. They leveled the building. Uh, Felix was the last one to be evicted, and he died just a few weeks later or a couple a month or two later. So it's like where the victory side of it comes in, the community was so outraged that they never were able to build their the 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 uh, high rise that they were planning on building. And ultimately, they built a um a community center with a museum to the struggle. So, and the posters are one of the main things that organized, kept it alive and, and continued to tell the story. Next one, please. I won't be talking quite as long about the other the other four, um, but this is a poster from, from Brooklyn from 2007. The, the, the earlier poster was 1979. Uh, and it's, you know, pretty much the, 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 the standard slogan they pro their profit versus our community stopped the gentrification in Brooklyn. Um, and this was put out by the um, Families United for Racial and Economic Equality and uh, Christopher Cardinale did the primary design. Um, you can see that, you know, the people that are trying to put the buildings on top of the people who are fleeing and then the people are organizing together and pushing the buildings out. So that's a kind of the, the shorthand version, visual version. The next one, please. Uh, this is a silk screen. We don't know. It was from the uh, 21st century, but we don't know when it was. Interesting, because this is not very far from where the center is. And we sent this picture all over that community, and we never were able to, to identify the artist. But their Boyle Heights, there's a lot of gentrification in LA, as in most cities around the country. And um, they've really been fighting back. And this particular you know, poster from Boyle Heights community of East LA, the Boyle Heights working class community wants better neighborhoods, but with the same neighbors. Yes, give us better services, give us cleaner streets, give us more, you know, better trans better public transportation, but don't evict the people who are here to and you know, don't replace the people that are here and give a a um a wealthier community the services. The people that are here now basically is they deserve those services as a message. The, the next um, slide, Micah Bazant from the Bay Area. Um, I don't watch my neighbors, I see them. We make our community safer together. And it's just 
uh, you know, it's, it's just a beautiful, a lot of posters are very militant, very negative. And Micah Bazant has an incredible ability to, to really make positive statements while making the same kind of, um, uh, well, he, the complaint is there of what usually happens, but he's, but, but it's not, but it's done in a very positive, aff affirmative way. And then the final poster um, is the uh, from also from Berkeley from 2006 from the Community Health Works, and the the picture the image is actually from a Frida Kahlo painting, but I thought the slogan was a a, a perfect slogan for um, for this section of the, of my presentation that social justice is the foundation of community health, and it's actually the foundation of of community. So. Um, those are, the, those are the five posters that I chose. Should I go into how I founded the center now or should I let someone else come in first? I, I think we'll um, we'll go on to uh, the next panelist and look at all of the presentations and then we'll come back to questions and, and more statements. And we would love to know more about the center and your founding of it. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, thanks. Um, uh, Emily, so sorry yeah. to, to do your presentation. Yeah, of course. Hi, I'm Emily. I'm the archives director at the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, and I work with Carol. I've sort of been asked to join the talk to provide a little more detail about how here at CSPG we provide access to the protest poster collection um, and about the work that sort of happens behind the scenes. Um, so we, CSPG is a really small organization with a large collection of over 90,000 human rights and protest posters, um, and basically consists of two adjoining office suites where we keep all of the posters. Um, and we've cataloged over 30,000 unique posters during the last 34 years of CSPG's existence. So about 30% of our collection is fully cataloged on an item level. Um, and the vast majority of the posters are stored here in flat file drawers. Each drawer has about a dozen large archival folders, which are shown on the table in this image. And each folder contains a big batch of posters. Um, so we sort the posters either by topic or by country or by artist. Um, and all of the, you know, 3,400 plus folders in the archive are listed in an archival finding aid um, that researchers can access online. So they can at least have um, a reference point, a an inventory, um, so they can request specific folders to view. Um, they can request research appointments. Um, we have researchers that come to the center from all over the world, and our research audience is very diverse. It includes activists, organizers, curators, artists, scholars, and educators. Um, could you show the next slide, please? Yeah, so the biggest uh, priority for our archive right now is digitizing the collection. This is especially important for us because we have so many international posters and people are not always able to travel to the center to do research here. Um, so for most of CSPG's history, we sent posters to an outside vendor to be photographed. Um, but since January 2022, we've set up a digitization studio in-house and we're photographing the posters on site. And our archivists have digitized over 32,000 posters since we started this project. And this is a really great accomplishment for such a small organization. We really only have four staff people that work directly with the collection. Um, next slide, please. So all of this digitization work is kind of in the service of putting our posters online on a collections website so that the public can freely access our collection. We've had a small collections website since about 2015, but we're in the process of rebuilding it and changing it to include more images and to have the ability to zoom in on the poster images and kind of see finer details. Um, could you show the next slide, please? This, this slide kind of gives you a taste of what we're going for. The site will have sort of a list of all the folders in the archive, and then you can see the record for one folder here. 
So there's the title, artist groups, Taier Grafica Popular. Um, and next to where it says description, there are like names and keywords about what items are in that folder um, to make it, you know, text searchable. Um, and on the new website, you'll be able to see the images of the poster that are inside the folder. So this is sort of what we're aiming for. Um, and yeah, right now we're mostly just focusing on digitizing the poster collection and constructing this upgraded website um, to give the public access to the images. And we're hoping to launch this new website at the beginning of next year. Um, but yeah, thanks so much for your time. And I appreciate the chance to speak about the work that we do here. Thank you so much, Emily. Uh, let's move on to Dr. Kenneth Orovitz. We'll cue those up. Thank you. This is a hybrid um, presentation. So we're online and we're sitting here in the room. All right, can everyone hear me on the Zoom? Yes. I apologize if I'm not looking at the owl, but look at the screen. This is a new modality for me. Uh, so I'm Dr. Kenneth Orvitz. I'm here with University College at the University of New Mexico. And I'm going to be talking a bit about my work, my research into comics, zines, print, and new media. Uh, so I received my PhD in uh, literature very recently, 2023. Uh, and in that program, my focus was on studying and teaching recently canonical literary graphic novels. So uh, Our Speaker's Mouse, Mark Antitrophy's Persepolis, Alison Bechtel's Fun Home. Those are often considered the three canonical graphic novels, as much as a work can be canonical when it's come out the last 20 years. Um, but in the course of my research, I began to dive into works that began to experiment with comics form. Right, it's often that we think of comics as a genre, but rather comics is a medium of expression and it's not limited to certain types of content, but rather uh, is a mode of expression with very uh, indistinct and flexible boundaries. And so works like Footnotes in Gaza by Joe Sacco and What It Is by Linda Berry, pages of which are depicted on the screen, really got me thinking about uh, the gray areas between comics and other medias. From there, I decided to go really crazy with it, and I decided to focus in explicitly on experimental comics. So experimental comics, they reimagine comics formal devices, favoring purposeful, radical, and sometimes playful deviation from tradition. And one of the key areas I was exploring was comics as visual objects. So comics as image text objects rather than merely image texts thinking about the vitality of objecthood and preserving and reading in a literary sense the way that comics are functioning as distinct objects. Uh, so for instance, on this slide, I have uh, excerpts from three works. On the top uh, is a work from the Haida manga artist, Michael Nicole Yangulanis called Red. Uh, Red is a book, but if one would have two copies of the book and rip out all of the pages, it could be arranged on the wall to create a mural as depicted in that image. Uh, in that sense, the book is really uh, deconstructing the notion of boundaries and borders. It's a comic, but as you can see, it isn't using conventional panels, but rather form lines uh, indigenous to the height of people. Uh, and so Michael Yagulanis' work really explores that type of object breaking, dimensional breaking. On the bottom right, we have work by Jakob Pelzebu, who is an Instagram uh, cartoonist who is really exploring that format. And then in the bottom left, uh, we have work by the cartoonist Lale Westbind, uh, which is printed in Rezograph, um, which I'll get into in a second. But overall, experimental comics are an independent on the ground experimental artsy comics community. You find a place like uh, APQ Zine Fest, for instance, mm -hmm. a lot of wonderful experimental comics. Right. 
So risograph printing uh, was one area I was invested in in my dissertation. Some folks might be familiar with it, some folks not. Uh, risograph emerged in the 1980s as a means of job printing, printing ephemeral materials. It's extremely compact, yet can print materials very quickly and in multiple colors. So it was originally favored for things like cruise ships, churches, small organizations to put out materials quickly. Uh, it builds off of mimeograph technology. So essentially, uh, you create a digital stencil. You then put in an ink drum of one predetermined color. Then the stencil prints onto that ink drum in a singular color. Resograph is a dry ink, so you can print layers immediately, which allows for multicolor prints, as that little diagram is illustrating up there. And the time since it was invented, it's become a favored medium for the small press, uh, especially for comics and zine creators who are used to using, or maybe say stealing prints from Kinkos. Uh, Rezograph opened up a whole new world of color possibility and expressive possibility. Uh, part of my dissertation research, I interviewed 12 Rezograph printmakers from Rezograph studios across the country um, about their work, about their community oriented work, uh, and then I put that in this little zine. I actually had a bigger zine, but this is the one I just printed at Rizalana last week, uh, which is a local Albuquerque Rizograph studio. I have one more slide. This is not related to comics, but uh, it is related to archival work and new media, and I thought it'd be fun to share. When I was at Northeastern, I was part of a project called Letterpress Goes 3D. We had a letterpress studio called Huskiana Letterpress and we explored techniques for using laser engraving on wood as well as 3D printing to replicate historical woodcuts. So on the left is a woodcut from the early 1900s by Thomas Nason that we recreated uh, using laser engraving on wood. Uh, we also have an illuminated letter being 3D printed there. Uh, and then we also integrated new technologies with letterpress design. So for instance, we 3D printed a QR code that was type high uh, that we could then integrate into our promotional uh, bookmarks. So lots of fun with new and old media. Thank you, Dr. Orvitz. And um, uh, let's move on to our final panelist presentation from Dr. Suzanne anderson Rito. Yeah, all right. Um, let me see if this yeah. maybe works or not. Yeah, so I'm gonna change a little bit the focus um, in that I'm looking at work and I brought to you today, particularly one work um, that was produced in the early 19th century and was a very, very successful print album, print uh, project in the early 19th century. And it focuses of what was then called the fine arts, so really within the art dialogue. Um, and I'm bringing this project because I find it's fascinating um, as a work that we don't necessarily think of as a you know, political engagement work. Um, but when you look a little bit deeper, you can really see the layers of it and, and its effects. So um, I just wanted to remind people a little bit that the beginning of printmaking in Europe, which is you know my focus, is in the 15th century, and it's really a revolution, like it was you know in the 15th century, like what we are experiencing in the 20th, 21st century with digital images. Meaning, for the very first time, images could be reproduced. Um, you have multiples of of these images that traveled to different places, so it opens up entirely. Uh, kind of new questions in in the in the arts. Um, a big role for printmaking had been to, on the one hand, make known um, an artist's work, sometimes produced by the let's say painter, and that's an example here on the left. Dürer produced this print of the Presentation of Christ in the early 16th century. This Dürer is a Renaissance artist from Germany. But this print circulated in Italy, and the Renaissance painter Raphael knew about Dura because of the prints. 
not because of his paintings, but which you know his was his main work. And as a result, is they get in touch via letter writing and uh, they are exchanging work. So Dura's work is known in Italy through his prints. So that's completely kind of changing your audience, changing your influence. Another really big and important role for printmaking is reproducing existing works of art. We don't really think of that today because we're so focused on originality. But up to the 19th century, probably the biggest role of prints, of the multiple of a print, is making a print after another work of art. And that's what you see here on the right, where you have an 18th century print after a 17th century um, uh, Netherlandish painting um, showing the scene uh, now in black and white. And I also wanted to focus, uh, I want to draw your focus on what's underneath the print. It's not only uh, the title of it, but it also tells you who owns the print. Uh, not the print, sorry, the, who owns the painting. So in other words, uh, prints can serve as knowledge carriers, right? You learn about other works of art um, through the prints, but you also learn about the wealth and the status of those who own works of art. So it's um, a, a print can really kind of emphasize the social um, position of the owner of artworks. And another very important role of printmaking is um, that it provides models for artists. So be it the fully reproduced print becomes the model for, for an artist to learn about the vocabulary, about the composition, etc. cetera. Um, and it was in, in French training, art school training, you started by making copies of drawings and prints. And that's what you see here in the image in the center. So it's um, you don't start with drawing after a 3D object or let alone an, um, a live model, but every artist and every artisan as well um, really started with studying uh, prints first, making copies of them first. So my research right now is focused on this um, print album that's called the Musée Francais, the French Museum which is a huge compendium of prints uh, bound in four volumes and produced between 1803 and 1812 and produced by over 150 engravers from over nine different countries. So it's a truly international vast project that was funded um, by uh, private publishers. Um, however, the state got interested in it very, very quickly and it made it very successful because what it represents, this is a, a series of prints um, representing works of art from the Louvre Museum in Paris. The Louvre Museum was opened as a national museum just 10 years prior, um, the first prints uh, emerged in 1793. And if you just recall what the Louvre was, was basically the, um, royal collections and then during the revolution they added the collections from churches to it and aristocrats um, that made up the collection and when it opened as a national museum the first national museum that we have very quickly under napoleon uh, with the revolutionary wars of napoleon um, he not only conquered lands but he also conquered cultures and when after the army had invaded a, a, a city and you know a land um they would pull out the artworks and bring them all to france so france becomes the hub not only politically but also culturally so now this museum is really um is larger than anybody had ever seen before it's a huge collection the louvre museum under napoleon and it has all the great pieces that people have been admiring, such as the Naoko one that you see here on the left, or Leonardo's uh, Saint Anne that you see here on the right. Interestingly, is that this reproduction of these artworks was unbelievably successful. Um, and we know that because we find this album everywhere. We find it in private and public collections, in libraries, in trade schools throughout Europe. But we even find it, or I found it in South Africa and also in the Americas. So question then is why? Why is such a thing so 
um, successful in, in its own time? And I think the answer is because it's a powerful didactic and that is a propagandistic tool. So um, if you bear with me, I just wanted to look at one print in particular. And this is a print by Tardieu, a French engraver, relatively young at the time, who um, reproduced a famous painting by Raphael that was in the Louvre at the time, St. Michael. Um, and this is then published um, in the third volume, I believe, of the Musée Francais. So when we think of reproductive prints, we think of copies, right? It's like, oh, it's just the same thing in black and white, and it's a little smaller. Well, um, it really isn't that when we start looking at it closely. It's kind of a very unique, uh, temporary look at this painting that the engraver takes for his own place and time. So one thing we, of course, we have to consider that a painting is, uh, this painting here by Raphael is relatively large. The print is one sixth of its size. So, you know, I try to size it down, but not too much so that you can't see anything anymore, right? So, um, but yeah, it's, it's very, very small compared to the original painting. And of course it's tonal, right? It's black and white rather than um, colorful. So that means the artist can't just copy, but the artist has to make changes. The engraver has to make changes. Uh, some of them is like, you know, how do you deal with this new uh, scale? How do you deal with the new uh, color range or tonal ranges? So what we see is that uh, Tardieu actually changes things a little bit. So look carefully that, um, for instance, the devil and the angel, the figure composition, is actually moved a little bit closer to us. Why? Well, in this in this reduced version of the you know, reduced size of the version, it really emphasizes this, the position of this angel, the, the powerful, forceful position of this figure group, um, rather than letting us escape into this wide open space, right? So, so it's an adjustment of these things, rather than color with a, a kind of golden type of a color or yellowish colors and soft warm uh, nuances, the engraver has um, the line. It, it can't really be painterly, it has to be linear because of how you create a viewer and engraving. Um, and also instead of color, what you have is maybe a brilliant black and white, but not the, not the painterly effects of a color. So we have all of these adjustments um, at the time, but then if we look even uh, a bit more detailed, we can see that even within the details, he starts to make changes, subtle, but ne never, nevertheless changes. So for instance, if you look at the uh, uh, at the left where you see Raphael's um, angel, just the lower part of him, look at the tunic, that's this golden tunic or uh, you know, soft color tunic, that's very decorative. Um, uh, from this angel that then the engraver translates into this much more functional linear uh, kind of, um, um, uh, you know, um, tunic or, you know, whatever the soldiers are wearing <laughs> at these times. And if you look at the devil, um, the, the uh, face in particular, the, the whole articulation of this devil becomes so much more straightforward, right? He has this grimace and he has these incredible claws that are, uh, that, that really show the strength and the, and the, um, the tail becomes really scaliness. In other words, he has to translate these things. But what that also means is that when we now start to step back again, instead of having this divine figure of Raphael, what we have is much more, you know, this young, powerful fighter. He's like a soldier, completely calm in action. Meaning, again, for the time, you know, we're talking at a time when Europe is in war, this resonates with people. And sure enough, this print is, way, is winning prizes, um, and um, one of the top prize at the time, and people are really saying, this is the way we need to look at um, old old masterpieces through, through print making. And then we find this print, um, sorry, one more, it stopped, well, here we go. Um, <laughs> 
Okay. Um, and then we find these print albums, and that's what I wanted to show you with that picture on the right. Um, just the size of it, right? These are large albums that we're talking about. We find this um, album in Rio de Janeiro, in the National Collections of Rio de Janeiro. And that really, I thought, was striking. Like, why in this world are we now bringing these prints um, and finding them in, in places so far away from the Louvre? But what's fascinating is that um, it seems that this print or these, these albums actually came to Brazil with a group of French artists in 1816. So right after the fall of Napoleon, many people had to leave France because they were too closely aligned with the Napoleonic regime. And these artists left um, France to come to, Port to come to Brazil to establish a French style art school in Rio de Janeiro, which at this point is the capital of the Portuguese colony. And the Portuguese king was actually residing in there at the time and backed this pro um, project wanting to bring, and, uh, bring in these French artists to build a school, which ultimately resulted in the Imperial Academy of Fine Arts that was founded in 1822. So artists bring these prints with them, why? Well, again, remember prints are training tools. So it's excellent training materials for artists to learn the visual vocabulary, um, to learn you know, what is the quote unquote great art, great art of Europe that now becomes the model for artists who are working for a European colonial court um, to learn to learn um, their work and their language and their uh, vocabulary. So I would argue that the prints indeed serve a very political uh, role here as outlining a European canon in the arts, outlining a cultural ideal for the arts. The prints now reinforce Europe's cultural political hegemony in this colonial world. So a little bit of different uh, focus. And I just wanted to add maybe one more thing. I'm working right now with a group of scholars um, and um, on this particular project of the Musée Francais, and we're trying to put together um, a website with the digital imagery and the kind of archival material and new interpretations of this work that was so successful throughout the 19th century. Thank you, Dr. Anderson Riedel. Um, this is also fascinating, and I almost can't contain my excitement <laughs> about you know just hundreds of years of printmaking. It's it's very exciting. We have about um, fifteen minutes or, or so left in our um, in our time together, so um, I'm going to open it up a little bit to questions here online. Uh, but first, I want to also introduce Jennifer Jordan, who is the OER librarian. And so we've been working together today. So I just want to um, just want to add a face to this this tech support. A lot more than that, obviously. And then I also want to mention that um, those of you who are over in Albuquerque in the room, um, there is an, uh, a small um, exhibit inside of Zimmerman. If you just go diagonal to this room, um, it's called The Visual Power of Print, Images from the Sam L. Slick Collection. So there is a print by Carol A. Wells in this collection, it and it's really the, the impetus for this entire event was finding this print and then connecting the print to, to a living artist and then saying, would you please? Would you please be on this panel? <laughs> so, um, so that's how that all happened. And please go take a look at the the prints. They're 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 beautiful. They're fascinating, and um, and they're exciting. So, I am going to start uh, some questions. But please, let's let's make this a little um, a little less formal. I've got questions that I can. Oh, thank you. There it is. Um, that's uh, the print that I was just speaking about. Um, and I'm sorry, but Carol, is this your first print? Is this what you were telling me uh, recently? Uh oh, you're muted. Oh, muted. There. Okay. No, it's not my first poster. I did my first oh. poster, and I, I don't consider myself a poster artist. I've I've probably made a half a dozen posters, but it was kind of like by default because there was nobody else around to do something that needed to be done, or that I felt needed to be done. 
but my, but that my first in fact all of the posters at least of the first most most of the posters that I made we're not talking huge volume were about um, Central America's struggle which is how I got involved in how I trans transformed from a medievalist to a a, a poster collector and exhibitor um, because it had to do it was that life changing trip to Nicaragua that I did. Um, Actually, that's not even true. That was 81 and my first poster was 1979, but it was also about Nicaragua. It was as a fundraiser for the Nicaraguan Literacy Crusade. So the Nicaraguan Revolution was actually very central to the to the to my education and transformation from the from the 12th century to the 20th. Wow, thank you. Thank you. And so I want to start with you um asking a few questions. So would you please tell us um how you started this archive and and why? I know you've kind of answered this, but maybe expand that for us. Well, I, I really refer to it as an accidental archive, although I know a lot of archives consider themselves accidental because my, you know, my my passion for for justice, which I've been exhibiting and working on since high school and civil rights movement, Vietnam War protests were um and then in my passion for art, I became an art historian. Uh, really came together in the in the political poster. I was like, I was just like, wow, they these th two things that I'm passionate about. And I this was in the middle of Reagan, President Reagan's war against the people of Central America. And I was using the posters produced in Central America to to um, create a different narrative, to create a narrative of they were trying to get a better life for themselves, feed their families develop healthy care, get an education, and the U.S. was trying to prevent all of that. So it really started out as an organizing tool for people to use in the United States as, as a way of a, one more tool of organizing against the war to get the war to stop. Kind of things never change. We're still using posters to promote wars and to stop wars. And um, it went, this was before the internet, before texting, before, and it was all through word of mouth, through solidarity activists, that this exhibition, which did started in 1981, and it went literally went around the country repeatedly from 1981 to 1989, all through word of mouth, all through the Solidarity Network. And every place I would go with the exhibition, people would take me to the, the local bookstore, which was usually a university town, a lot of left, left bookstores, and they all had leftover posters from past events. And so I helped them clean house. And um, and I would come back from every every lecture, every exhibition with 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 piles and piles of posters, and that's that was really the the origin of of the Center for the Study of Political Graphics, which actually didn't didn't uh, wasn't incorporated until 1988, but um, it was and I it was founded to be a resource for activists because although the exhibition and the initial collection was Central America. They, I quickly became, you know, I think the second exhibition I did was on women's rights. The third exhibition was on liberation theology. And then it just kept, it kept growing and growing. And it, people say, we need an exhibition on this. A former political prisoner says, you know, could you do an exhibition on political prisoners? I said, well, if you help me, I'm sure we can find the posters. So that's really how it happened. People would come to us and they would want us to work with them to create a labor exhibition or a, a, you know, a, a, an AIDS exhibition. And we were able to, you know, find the posters and work with them to create an exhibition. And then they just kept, they, our exhibitions have actually been uh, over 400 venues of uh, the United States and internationally, you know, since, since 81. So that's kind of astounding when you think of a shoestring. Well, yes, that it, it, it is, it is astounding. Um, so I have a question about archiving specifically. Like I just, you know, I noticed in um, in Emily's presentation, um, you have acquired um, a, a way of scanning your posters um, to make it easier. And, and I think we were talking about this earlier, you know, in another conversation, that this came about during the pandemic. Um, as a necessity to be able to, to keep working in some way. Um, Emily, would you talk to us a little bit about, um, about making that shift into um, scanning your own work in-house? Yeah, that was, a, that was our big pandemic project. Um, 
CSPG in its history as an organization has gone through a lot of different digitization efforts. You know, in the 90s, early 2000s, they made slides and then the slides were scanned. And then we started realizing that the slot, that the images were too small. So we needed larger images. Um, so for a long time, uh, CSPG was able to use an outside vendor to photograph our posters as needed for research requests and for exhibitions. Um, and yeah, during the pandemic, the studio closed that we had used for a long time. Um, they decided to just completely shift their business model and not do any more photography. Um, and yeah, we had long, for a long time, dreamed of being able to photograph the posters in-house and be able to photograph more posters because it is a lot of work to inventory the posters, to deliver them to the photographer, to do the quality control, like checking all the files when you get them, and then inventorying the posters when they come back. Um, so it was something that uh, we'd wanted for a long time and uh, the pandemic just sort of provided an excuse because we did look at other vendors um, and they were quite expensive because the thing about posters is they're all oversized. They're all considered oversized and photographers tend to structure their pricing around the size of the objects. Um, so eventually it just became more cost effective and more you know what we wanted um in terms of you know being able to utilize the archive to have something in-house um and we got a lot of help from an archivist in the bay area named lincoln cushing who did a poster digitization project um and we had a lot of help from uh sort of a someone who volunteered um a photographer at the Getty Research Institute who sort of helped us pick out equipment and trained us to use it. Um, so yeah, we've sort of been doing the digitization effort in earnest since January, 2022. And how will how this um, affect your inevitable, uh, inevitable expansion? I mean, you're going to end up having more things in the archive. How has this upgrade, how is this upgrade going to support that growth? Well, th th that's, that's, I don't know if you want to tackle You can go one. ahead, you can go ahead. Okay, um, um, that's actually part of the, the, the longer question about the future of the center, because initially, I mean, for over 30 years, we had rent-free space and that was, um, we were supposed to have that in perpetuity and it, it was part of a foundation that was uh, about a, a over a dozen groups had rent free space and it was it was built in and then after the founder of the foundation died um his son was able to find a loophole and destroy the foundation and we were not able to we fought it for a couple of years but we weren't able to convince the court the attorney general that um something was off here so we 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 don't know the long term future of the center and digitizing the entire collection um, is going to allow us to continue to function whether or not we um, we are the holders of the actual objects and so before we we don't we don't we want to be we want to stay independent because there's nothing else like us um, we're also. Our, we'll consider a partnership with an existing institution, and there are some models for that. I know USC is in a partnership with the One International Gay and Lesbian Archives, and that's been working well for quite a while. Um, so we we we're not sure what's what's where we're going, but we are sure that we are going to digitize the whole collection before any final decision is made, so that it will we will at least be able to make sure that these ninety thousand posters continue to be in the public access because they were made for people to use as tools for educating and organizing people to action. And so it would be terrible if they were buried in some institutional arc, you know, basement and, 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 and not have, and, and not 
accessible to the public. So that's that's our that's our priority. Yes, I mean, I think it's um it's a battle between being able to archive and then this idea of impermanence and um and and who decides what is not what's what's important and what should be recycled. Um, quite frankly, um, I, speaking of impermanence, I I want to talk to Dr. Orvis, and I'm sorry I'm looking this way and not not at you, and I'm trying to connect with everybody. Um, uh, could you tell us a little about uh, a little bit about zine making and a little bit about the impermanence of that and and the you know the the struggle between keeping a zine alive um, for you know future folks to take a look at and you know what kind of things are important to you in that respect? Yeah, I mean, I'm sure it's a topic that you're also very familiar. Yes. Um, and zine making is so powerful because it is rooted in. Uh, unfettered individual expression and community. When someone sets out to make a zine, they're not reliant on a network of publishers, manufacturers, distributors. It is them who is set upon making this work uh, for themselves or for other people in the community to read. Um, and that comes with certain challenges for archiving and collecting zines. Um, zines are made in very small runs. Uh, for instance, with Rezo, you can very rapidly print somewhere between 100 to 1,000 copies of a zine. But once you go above 1,000 copies, it is not at all practical because you have to hand collate everything, uh, among other reasons. Zines themselves, in part because they're based in, we could say, manufacturing methods that are so DIY, are not... Uh, strong objects, right? This is, you know, staple bound, right? And as a result, there is a sense of inevitable decay that accompanies the limited run of the zine in the first place. For instance, the Rizograph ink, it's a dry ink, is only ever meant for ephemeral materials. The archival resilience of Rizograph is still very much unproven. Uh, and one reason why in my project, I wanted to interview zine makers and uh, zine print studios and publishers was because uh, at least then we would have some type of artifact of the work that was being done, even if the work that itself was not accessible in the future. Uh, I think it's going to be, it's a huge challenge to reduce CD emergence of zine libraries, but the idea of a comprehensive one uh, is almost impossible and i wouldn't say that it's antithetical to the nature of zines but it's the intense locality and intimacy of a zine makes it very difficult for that archive to exist yes it's true i mean if, if you know a zine maker you know them mm -hmm. you've read their zine you know who they are mm -hmm. um it's very very it's connective tissue somehow it's very strange mm -hmm. But it also makes me think of um, the presentation from Dr. Anderson Riedel about um, about the subtle changes in um, in a masterwork and then a masterwork of print. Um, would you talk a little bit about how graphic artists overcome the perception that their art is a repro just a reproduction, as opposed to a dialogue across time or? you know, across design. Would you talk, talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, I think actually that is, it, it has been a problem for artists in the past, but the problem is much bigger today because, you know, I would say since the later 19th century, there is such an emphasis on originality, uh, which really didn't exist uh, prior. And because this kind of printmaking was taken over by photography, right? And then, then we're talking what? Is it now a documentation or is it an interpretation? So, you know, this is, these are questions that um, are discussed with, with photographers and photo historians as well. Well, we're very much. But one way for the artists that I was talking about to overcome that institutionally is, by the way they were trained. And that's actually really interesting. Uh, printmakers were part in the early 19th century of the fine art academ um, academic system where artists in France are trained um, actually print printmakers were trained at, in a printmaking studio 
Yes, but absolutely. But they were also um, asked to join the studios of painters and sculptors. So we have a number of artists who, who worked with Jacques-Louis David, one of the biggest names at the Times, or one of the biggest studios, or with really, really successful uh, sculptors. And some of them actually became painters or sculptors. Mm -hmm. um, but the reason of it was that they truly understood how a painter is working, how a painter is expressing certain things, and then translate that into their own, into their own techniques and, and ways of expression. And I think that was an epitomal moment to recognize that even if you translate an image from one medium into another, you truly have to understand your model and rethink it. And it's so it's that rethinking of re-experimenting of with forms and with expression in, in the arts that um, make them being recognized as worthy works of art in their own right. And then, you know, people have access to it. And I think that's another big part because, um, you know, only the Pope owns the Lauren sculpture. <laughs> I mean, but now I can put it up in my house. And so I think, yes, you adhere to the image that you see, but you also really embrace the quality of the print. And so that accessibility, you know, with the posters to move people to action, in this case, is to include them in that fine art discourse. Um, and I think that's a really an important part of why prints were so unbelievably successful, um, even, even though they were reproductions. I really do appreciate your presentation because I'm reflecting on looking at um, a painting of Albert, uh, Albert Durer my whole life and looking at his, his fingers mm -hmm. and, and realizing that his hands were not, he was not just positioning that way, his hands were shaped that way through making photography <laughs> from, you know, cutting into wood and, you know, cutting into stone. So um, it's, it's very obvious that that printmakers are artists because they are using their bodies. I mean, it's, it's the same as musicians who are using their hands to play instruments become the shape of that, of that need. Um, and it's true of jazz artists that we are interpreting music, um, someone's original music, we interpret a different, a different way, a variation or a variant in, in comic book making. So looking intently at something is not copying it. It is it is internalizing it and then expressing it uh, as a as a human being. Uh, it's incredible collaborative work. Yeah. <sighs> okay. So, um, we're coming to the to the end of our discussion. Um, are there any questions? There's one in the chat. There's one in the chat. Okay. Um, By Jerry, I think. All right. Would you help me find that on a sure. little? Oh, go ahead. Yeah. I'm an hi. I'm an artist whose work is archived in CSPG. Hi, Carol. I have a question for the expert on beams and comics, but it extends to other forms of archiving as well. Much of comics, particularly experimental comics that play with the form, are both physical objects and nowadays often contain links to aspects of the comic that only exist digitally, and in that way, exist as multiple mediums that are also only one medium simultaneously. How does one store those aspects of physical media when they extend beyond the tactile, but are still technically part of the zine and comic? Yeah, so you're thinking of something like a hyperlink within a comic to a digitally related work. I see you on the screen, so not if that's what you're thinking of. <laughs> that, that, that's part of what I'm thinking of, yeah. Yeah, um, so... It, I've also seen comics linked to 3D models even on mm -hmm. online. So that's where it gets really complicated, I would think. Yeah. There's a work I'm thinking of as well called, uh, I think it's called Beyond Pen and Pixel by Amaranth Borsuk, where uh, you hold up the book to a webcam and then it generates a rotational 3D model of the abstract image contained within the book, uh, if I'm remembering how that works correctly. The other iconic one I think of, it's not even a zine at all, but there was this really terrible horror movie called The Devil Inside. And then it didn't have an end to the movie. It just was like, if you want to see the end of the movie, go to the devilinside.com. Well, you go to the devilinside.com and it no longer exists. The movie has no ending, right? 
And I think that's a very, the tricky thing about digital media, especially web hosted digital media, is it is so reliant on a continual stream of capital. Like if it is not being financially supported, it is not going to exist. And you know, the only thing more impermanent than a zine might be a website, right? Um, and I think that is just a intense institutional challenge and a choice that a zine maker makes where when they include something that is digital in their work, they have to accept that there is going to be ephemeral unless they put in the financial supports to maintain an online service. That's tough. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought a more optimistic answer, but that's that's yeah. Thanks for that question, Jared. Um, any anyone else have questions they'd like to pose? Audience, Hello, I audience. Have just one one little comment that maybe connecting parallel um, um, medieval studies to going into the poster world and thinking about the palimpsest and to what extent that has a very ephemeral form and just reusing materials in order to bring the most needed up to date contemporary thoughts that need to get put on parchment on, or on, on um, other media um, kind of brings the old back to the new and vice versa. Uh, I just have actually a little comment. A lot of people think, how could you go from the 12th century to the 20th? But it's not, when you think about I mean, all art is political. No, not all art is overtly political, but all art is, everything is political. But the the medieval art was some of the most overtly propagandistic art that was, you know, that was ever made. It was, it was totally upfront in glorifying the state and glorifying the church and glorifying, I mean, you know, and then the Renaissance became more secular. So the politics of their art was certainly a little less in your face, but it was totally there. So the in-your-face aspect of the propagandistic quality of medieval art is like a political poster. I mean, it's in your face and it's and it's out there. So it's um, you know, the the, the trick becomes finding the political uh, interpretation of things that are aren't so blatant. Because when I you know I've been challenged, I make that statement all the time: all art is political, or everything is political. Every billboard is political, but people say, oh, it's not. And it's just they're not they know how to read it. They don't know how to read, you know, what what's out there, how the images are working on us. Thank you. For that. Yeah, I if I can just jump in, I, I completely agree and right and, and to see the nuances of that engagement with the public in the you know, political engagement with the public um is, is what's so fascinating when you look at these works and to get back to the digital archives. This, you know, like what you are, you are doing with your posters, um, digitizing them and really making them available. It might be temporal until we have a new web system and it all breaks down. But until then, the opportunity to to research, to learn, to engage with it is really something that is mind blowing, to be honest. Um, and you know, having the ability to go into archives, you know, from, from New Mexico, in Los Angeles, in Paris, in Rio de Janeiro, um, is something that can really help us to, to pose new questions, to examine the, the, these ideas in a new light. And the other thing that I wanted to bring up is um, the digitization, when you, you do it in, in a high quality, um, allows us today to see things that I haven't even seen with my silly little loop, um, you know, decades ago when you when you are at the work. Um, does the artist work necessarily so we can zoom in like this so crazily? No, that's not the idea, right? We're supposed to see it from a certain distance, but to understand of why things operate the way they are, and you can really go into that depth is just, yeah, it just changes how we comprehend some of those works. And I am so grateful <laughs> for your digital archives <laughs> to, to allow an access and to allow a study and a comparison that way that I really feel that we're in a very lucky time period right now to, to really widen our horizons with that way. 
it, it must be like looking at a distant star through a telescope just yeah yeah suddenly discovering something that's been there the whole time yeah you were able to get closer to it and you know when you talk about the artist hand you can see exactly where it starts where it ends where it swells where it... so all of these things right they say well that's a little geeky but <laughs> the geeky part is also sometimes when you're the fascination and they make it to you know the, the visual power that these works um have i love all of these works mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I just want to add one other thing. The 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 the, the folk. I mean, I think digital is critical. It's totally. It's opened up a whole new, many universes of 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 working with images and disseminating images. And 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 just a quick story. A a, a friend of mine, um, our, a wonderful artist name goes by the name Mister Fish, did a an image of Che Guevara merged onto the famous statue of King Tut. And he during the Tahir Square, and he put it on. He called it "Walk Like an Egyptian," and it was and it was put online. And the next day, somebody took a photograph of somebody in Cairo holding his piece. Yeah. yeah, it was just like you know one of these. You can't imagine things moving that fast and connecting us. But I also want if people are so, especially you know younger people, they're used to seeing everything this size. And it's it's different, and we have a lot of young interns every 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 year, and they actually touched the physical object that really was carried in a in a Black Panther Party demonstration or put on a car of a Black Panther Party funeral or you know was part of the United Farm Workers. It, it gives them chills, and it, it's 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 it has very different when you're seeing something this size than when you're seeing something this size that always looks the same in many ways. So there is there is something for getting people interested and informed, but also having access to the to the originals. I mean, if something is the size of a billboard, it has a very different impact and feeling than if it's the size of a of a, of a sticker. Stickers are important, but they have a different function, much more intimate. I said that for you, Jared. Because you make stickers. I was nodding. I don't. I don't know if it's clear on camera. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Um, are there any other questions before we close out? I just want to say thank you to um, everyone uh, watching, everyone in the room. I want to thank our panelists. Um, and this has been an amazing discussion, and I'm so glad it's recorded so we can go back and and review and come up with more ideas. Um, long live print, long live all of you. <laughs> Thank you, Mario, Thanks. Yes. for having the idea and organizing. Thanks. Thank you. OK, I think that's it. Let's, um, let's have one way. Should I end? Could our panelists stay on for um, a moment? Let me stop recording. <laughs> yeah.